Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, I'd like to introduce the event and um, talk a bit about the context which gave rise to Radical Networks and, um, and also um, give some background on where the name was inspired from. So Radical Networks is an annual conference that takes place um, at an exhibition that um, is about the social, political, and cultural issues surrounding um, computer networking and the internet today, and, and by extension, the web. Um, I co-organized it with my friend and co-conspirator Erica Kermani, um, who's still based in New York. And um, yeah, the event takes place over two to four days, depending on how many proposals we get. Um, I, I have a really hard time turning down really awesome works. And, um, and yeah, it happens usually uh, in October in New York City. And last year, for the first time, it took place in Berlin, which I hope to be a continuing thing, um, alternating between New York and Berlin on different years. Yeah, the event is a forum for people uh, doing radical things with networks and networking technology. Here, radical, I take it to mean the application of networking technology for social change, uh, for creative um, experimentation and critical investigations. So yeah, radical, um, it's also used to refer to, to people who are cracking open this so-called cloud to investigate how we're being surveyed, how our data is being used, and how we can ourselves use networking hardware, software, and protocols to self-host our own web servers, file shares, um, platforms, and networks, among many, many other possibilities. Um, it was, in fact, at first designed to be a kind of summit for basically everybody working with computer networks, um, whether in the context of art, policy, culture, um, social justice, activism, investigative journalism, um, engineering, academic research, community networks, performance, even architecture. Basically, anyone is invited to come and show their work as long as it's not from the commercial startup entrepreneur uh, advertising or social media world. Um, in fact, Radical Networks was created in direct response to the fact that almost every event that I knew about, at least in the States, was tied to one of these industries, and um, which I, I found both dismaying and, and also, well, really boring, but also disturbing that there were no events out there that, that offered a stage for critical viewpoints on what's actually happening with the internet and the web. I mean, I, I, I knew from myself, from, from my friends and my colleagues, that there were people out there doing much more interesting work with networks, with networking uh, tech and, and the internet than, than what we were being offered, um, you know, than, than advertising and, and social media. So, yeah, and you know, honestly, with the way things have been going, I think that um, we need as much support and exposure as possible for people doing this kind of work. So yeah, the event consists of a speaker track, we have an exhibition, we have a full day of workshops, both which can be either technical or discussion-based, and the workshops are personally of particular importance to me at the event, as I think it's really important to give people um, who maybe aren't themselves directly working in these domains, the opportunity to learn how to do some of these things them, themselves and to have experience working with these uh, technologies. I think of Radical Networks as a place for people to find collaborators outside of domains within which they're usually working because when I myself was getting into learning about, it started with mesh networks and, and offline networks, I encountered lots of people who came from art backgrounds like myself. Um, but rarely did I meet people outside of the art world and, and usually, you know, I, I had a project called called Subnodes from 2012, which, you know, was basically um, streamlined the whole process of setting up a Raspberry Pi to host your own web server and an and access point. And, and every time I would go to give talks about my project, I, I, everyone else in the audience was also an artist or someone that I knew. So I just thought that it would be useful to have an event where as well people from different domains like journalism or engineering or art or whatever could also come and meet each other and hear each other's perspectives and maybe find ways to, to work together um, outside of their own bubbles. So we have a call for proposals every year and we have all of our proposals since 2015 available in our GitLab. Well yeah, you can see right there we have 240 proposals since 2015 from people from all sorts of backgrounds submitting talks or artworks or workshops which they would consider to be radical networks um, it, and it's a great resource just to see what other people are out there doing. I've been online since 1994, approximately. Um, 
nonstop, never having logged off. Um, and, but I'm, I'm really glad I got to experience what, what the web was like back then, um, when it felt kind of like the Wild West. It, it was a, a very weird place um, with all kinds of freaks and geeks online um, <laughs> just hanging out. You know, it felt like a really eclectic space where um, it, it, it was a kind of pre-narcissistic version of the web before influencers and, 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 you know, and selfie culture and all that. Radical Networks was not created out of a sense of nostalgia or, or wanting to go backwards, but it did influence me to want to create an event that again considered the internet um, and the web as a space for creativity and collaboration and community as opposed to a place just for um, ego, power, and money. Um, and honestly, I also just wanted an event where people could just come together and just nerd out for three days about radio networking technology because it's, I mean, it's kind of cool. But before going any further, um, uh, I, I would like to talk about where the name Radical Networks came from. Um, and what in fact inspired the name was a publication um, that was first published in 1970 called Radical Software. This was a, peri a periodical published by Beryl Carot and Phyllis Gesherny, and it was exclusively dedicated to video and video art. So many similarities I found between the objectives of Radical Software and Radical Networks, I found it almost uncanny. So at the time of Radical Software's publication, television was the mainstream medium um, that was in almost everyone's homes. Um, it was a medium that was being overrun by advertising, um, broadcasting the same bland corporate messages into everyone's living room. And um, so Radical Software's um, agenda in response to this was to present a DIY alternative, um, promoting independent things like independent pirate television, um, sh um, publishing DIYs for how to make your own broadcasts and their own video art. And, you know, like Radical Software wanted to investigate video's place not only in art, but also in activism and social change, science and other seemingly disparate uh, places. There's this quote um, that I took from the, the RadicalSoftware.org um, history page, which is, quote, there was an editorial written by Beryl Corrid, Phyllis Gesherny, and Michael Schamberg noting the relationship between power and control of information and the importance of freeing television from corporate control. It also included a balanced assessment of technology as a cultural force and recommended an ecological approach to understanding it. The Rain Dancers, which was the name of the think tank which, uh, which bankrolled the, the, the publication, used the term ecology in its original scientific sense. Um, the study of systems within their environments. This applied to all systems, cultural, informational, and political, as well as referring to the natural systems as the term is usually understood today. We need to get good tools in, into good hands, not to reject all tools because they have been misused to benefit only the few. So I feel like if you replace television with, uh, with internet, this could easily be a quote from uh, today across all, all points, um, as we've seen a similar thing happening to the internet and to the web. Uh, the internet is no longer an obscure government academia project um, that only the nerdiest or most fringe of the public are, are, are participating in. And the web is no longer um, a, a wild west of grossly expressive geocities um, <laughs> sites taped together. The web has received a shiny, very sophisticated, uh, perfectly designed facelift. It's, it's a gallery of perfectly designed marketing messages, whether for corporations, you know, uh, like for corporate brands or, or for personal brands. There's been layer upon layer of abstraction stretched over the guts of the internet and the web, making it as, as seamless, simplified an experience as, as possible. And I think this is a problem. Because at, at what cost you know, has this happened? And you know, getting right into it, there are so many things that are completely wrong with the state of the web and the internet. Looking at the screen, this is just a handful of issues. Internet shutdowns, activists, the marginal people being unfairly targeted and harassed, surveillance, your data for sale, as Joanna showed, threats against net neutrality, walled gardens, and fake news. Um, there's, there's a need for as many events as possible critical of what's happening with our networks. 
at this point in time, we're fairly dependent on the internet, which is often called the cloud. Maybe people in this room know more what that actually means, but how many people in general really know what that means? It evokes as friendly and kind of feel good. As a marketing term, it does its job very well, but by giving it a label like this, it prevents us from thinking critically about what, what this actually means. And what it means is moving computing and data from our local machines to someone else's computer. Um, meaning we lose control over where and how our data is stored, not to mention becoming hooked into paying subscription fees till the end of time. Um, we lose the right to ownership, not only of our data, but of the tools themselves. Or I should actually re uh, reverse that, not only of the tools, but of our data, which is ar arguably the worst part. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to know what is actually going on behind the scenes when we participate in something on the web. And aside from losing the right to own, which is bad enough, but losing the ability to understand what's happening uh, behind the scenes, I think, is quite sinister. Because to obfuscate and to abstract um, the inner workings like this is to create a, an intellectual distance between ourselves and the very technologies which we're pretty dependent on these days. And um, you know, this creates a knowledge gap, which leaves us vulnerable, as you cannot adequately protect yourself against that which you don't understand. These fears, uh, these frustrations that I had, drove me to create an event like Radical Networks, because there are enough events out there for people to show off their newest uh, surveillance capitalist app, um, sure to make them a ton of money, with whatever slick uh, UI and seamless uh, experiences and you know at least in the states there were zero conferences like i mentioned that featured internet and web projects designed for the good of the commons for civic responsibility for creative expression and critical examination before highlighting some projects for medical networks itself um, i wanted to compare and contrast a couple um, situations which involved responses to natural disasters which helps illustrate some of the concerns i've i've already mentioned so um, I don't know if anyone here knows about Google's Project Loon. It's actually a project of Alphabet, which is a subsidiary of Google. And um, their mission is to, quote, bring connectivity to unserved and underserved communities, uh, supplement existing networks, and provide expedient coverage after natural disasters. It's basically a mobile cellular network comprised of a network of balloons floating 20 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Here's another friendlier. Uh, diagram. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, when Hurricane Maria hit in 2017, which devastated Puerto Rico, um, who came to the rescue to help restore basic infrastructure but Project Loon, um, they made a deal with the government in cooperation with T-Mobile and AT&T to deploy a mobile network of balloons to restore connectivity to over 100,000 people down below. On the surface, it might be hard to criticize this in the face of an emergency because these people had nothing before that. And, but you know, I don't think it's a huge stretch to wonder um, if this could be considered exploitative in any way. You know, I think we have to think critically about the scenario of a huge tech monolith like, like, like Google, whose whole business model is to profit off of our data, coming in to save the underserved um, people, since this is exactly the kind of situation which leaves people vulnerable to be taken advantage of, not having the ability to opt out. Another term for this kind of thing is, is a walled garden. Facebook and Google are the two main uh, perpetrators of this. According to Digital Content Next, these two alone account for 90% of, of ad tech. Ad tech being, yeah, like the, the, the technology that, that, that is behind collecting our data. Facebook deploys these walled gardens via drones. Google uses Project Loon, like we just heard about. Um, and I mean, obviously, Google and Facebook want to connect as many people as possible to, to the internet because that increases their revenues. And Facebook especially receives lots of criticism because their networks promotes their own site, in particular, blocking access to certain other sites. In the case of Project Loon, in, in uh, Puerto Rico, I would have questions. Um, do they collect data from those within their walled garden? And if so, what do they do with it? 
Is there any ability to opt out of that? Um, how would they react to a community-based competitor? Would they support the effort? And if, and if no, then why not? Um, what if a local infrastructure was um, set up? You know, like, would they support that or would they sabotage it? I understand that Google is a for-profit company, but I, I think we should, you know, I think we, we should ask, is it right to let someone like this into these devastated zones, creating a dependence on policies and, and, and technologies which the people have no control over? And, you know, I think that might be the very definition of exploitation. So, having told that bleak story, I would like to contrast it to a project called Red Hook Wi-Fi, which is a local neighborhood network which ended up serving as a recovery tool when another hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, struck New York in October of 2012. So Red Hook is a neighborhood in um, Brooklyn, a community where close to 70% of the residents live in public housing. It's also surrounded on three sides by water, making it particularly vulnerable to the hurricane. It suffered some of the worst damage of, of the whole city. Um, in the aftermath, cell networks were down and people um, had no way to communicate with each other, except for the fact that Red Hook Wi-Fi earlier in, in the year had been set up as a wireless mesh network created for and by the people in this neighborhood. It was born out of a partnership formed between the Red Hook Initiative um, and the Open Technology Institute. And um, Alex Baldwin, who was a master's candidate at Parsons School of Design, um, was responsible for designing the platform and the applications on it through an iterative process with, with the residents of this uh, neighborhood in order to create applications that best serve the people of the area. I mean, the great thing about Red Hook Wi-Fi is that it wasn't just some technology that was created you know, some, somewhere else in, in the context of a for-profit model and then just dropped into this area where people had no choice but to accept it. I mean, it was created in partnership with them. And, and the other thing that I really think is great about, about Red Hook Wi-Fi is that members of the community itself were recruited and trained to build the, the, to build the network out themselves. Um, which provided people an opportunity to feel invested in their neighborhood um, in whatever ways benefited them best by, by the people, not a profit-driven corporation. Um, it created a platform for local communication with applications tailored to address, to address specific needs of that neighborhood. So pictured here, um, there's just screenshots from three of the first applications which were launched on the platform. Um, the first one is was just an, an, an app that let people know when the buses were coming. Um, the one in the middle was like a bulletin board um, where people could post about events that they were taking part in um, or could also like ask questions um, if they were seeking some kind of advice, like legal advice or housing advice. And on the far right was an application where people could could report if they were a victim of, of, um, of stop and frisk. And briefly, stop and frisk is, is a program um, run by the New York City Police Department that is the temporary detainment, questioning, and also um, and, and searching. Like they'll go through your bags and everything of random people, except that stats show that 90% of those stopped and search are black or Latino between the ages of 14 and 24 and 70% 70, and 70 of them are found innocent. This was set up in early, in early uh, 2012, and when the hurricane came through in October, Red Hook Wi-Fi, you know, d despite the other commercial networks being, being uh, taken down by the storm, Red Hook Wi-Fi actually it survived. And by virtue of the fact that it was a mesh network, so it wasn't dependent on any outside connection to the internet, people were in fact able to still be in touch uh, with each other, and, and this actually is what put it in the news. So I mean, if it isn't obvious here, the key difference between Puerto Rico and this case in, in um, Brooklyn is that one feels, again, a bit exploitative, and the other is a community network which was designed for and by the people, um, which is going to presumably inherently have the community's interests in, in mind. So on the topic of community networks, I also would like to, of course, mention some of the bigger ones which exist in 
Europe and also in New York, um, some of which have been around for almost 20 years. There's Guifinet in Spain, um, Freifunk in, in Germany, NYC Mesh in New York, of course, and Athens Wireless Metropolitan. And in, um, yeah, this is a, a map of, of all the, the wireless links provided by Guifinet in um, Spain. Guifinet is actually the largest Wi-Fi uh, based long distance network in the world. Um, it has more than 50,000 miles of links with over 30,000 nodes. So I guess that the, the message to, to, to take away from this is that we can build our own networks if we want to. Um, we, just, we just have to work together to, to make that happen. So to back up just a, a bit, I wanted to, um, to talk about what, what does it actually mean to be radical in the context of, of computer networking. Formally, as an adjective, radical um, is defined as relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something or, or advocating a thorough or complete political or social change. Taking back control of this technology from third parties, even to a seemingly small extent, in order to learn how to create our own infrastructure um, can be seen as a radical act. As well as self-hosting your own web server or file shares, um, locally hosted software in resistance to police, unfair police practices, um, examining and questioning who networking technology is currently being designed to serve and who is being disenfranchised and exploited um, and how together we can address these issues. And, you know, in these ways, networks can be radical. These are real issues which have to be addressed, starting, I think, with community events like radical networks. If people want to know how to self-host, they should be able to learn that. Um, we need to restore the internet to a place where people can meet over shared interests and sharing information. And if not restore it, then at least be able to build parallel networks. It can be for reasons as crucial as organizing for a protest, um, for having a disaster response system in place, or it can be as casual as just wanting to, uh, to chat over shared interests and, and without being stalked by ad tech every step of the way. But part of that process um, includes de demystifying how networks work. Um, for sure, it can be very in intimidating and, and overwhelming to, to learn how these things work. You know, it's when you first, like I know that when I first started studying Wi-Fi and networking, it, you know, and myself with the background of, I mean, my background is computer is as a computer programmer, even then it was pretty intimidating. But at the end of the day, with some training, like the workshop that me and Joanna are going to run tomorrow, um, <laughs> it's not insurmountably expensive or difficult to learn the basics of how to set up your own, for example, your own web server or file share. I mean, no, it won't be as simple as just clicking a button and having like an instant install, but, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. And you know, this is something else that I think the, um, the seamless web has made us feel incapable at worst and lazy at best. It has lowered the bar, made it too easy for us to opt in to trading away our, our privacy and the integrity of our, of our, of our personal data. In, in other words, to sell ourselves in exchange for convenience and instant gratification. And not to sound preachy, because I'm 100% like part, part of that too. It's, it's, I mean, this is one of the main issues that I have, is, is how, uh, how locked down the internet and the web has, has become in this way. Just to quickly um, talk about some of the goals and ideals of, um, of Radical Networks. Yeah, I mean, our goals are to understand how this technology works and can be used as a method of control and therefore how to subvert that. Um, definitely a big, a big goal um, is to teach people how to use networking technology for themselves. Um, and of course, to encourage collaborative, creative, and social exploration with computer networks. As for our um, ideals, of course, we promote free and open networks built with free and open source hardware and software, um, connectivity for the commons with transparent terms, and that the commons maintains control of data, hardware, software, and means of deployment. So I, I, I just want to show um, a few projects which have been presented at Radical Networks in the past. 
The first piece is bail block, which is a cryptocurrency scheme against bail. This was both in our exhibition and given as a talk in Berlin last year by um, Grayson Earl, who's an American artist in New York, with additional collaborations by Maya Binyam, Francis Tseng, J.B. Rubinovitz, Sam Levine, Dhruv Mehrotra, and the Dark Inquiry Collective. Basically, the idea is that your idle processing power on your computer is used to mine for cryptocurrency, which is then used to help people awaiting trial who can't afford bail. Um, actually, workshop, which we hosted for um, two years at, at Radical Networks in both 2016 and 2017, is Wilderness Wireless by Brett Ian Balog, who's a Chicago-based artist doing all kinds of things with radio technology. But um, in both 2016 and 2017, he took participants through the process of building a solar-powered um, personal access point and, and web server. And uh, it was a very intense, this was like a very intense technical hands-on workshop, but it was for complete beginners, which everything is at, at Radical Networks. Like we tailor everything for people, um, you know, you don't have to have any experience or um, background. So, but yeah, uh, he had people soldering and assembling PCB boards and the enclosure complete with this. I mean, I, I apologize, I don't actually have a better photo. Um, I thought I did, but it didn't. But you, you, you can see, it's like, it's like a little squished lunchbox with this solar panel up front. He had everybody hand, hand wrap this, this cord. So there's like, it's an art, artisanal web server. Um, but, but it's actually a really beautiful object. Another workshop we had, which was more discussion-based, was the Queer Red Phone, designing interfaces and community accountability networks through the mesh. Um, this was actually the first Radical Networks in 2015, run by Erica Kermani, my co-organizer, and Mickey, and Mickey Foster. And in this workshop, participants um, imagined a direct emergency line which members of the queer co community uh, could have as a secure connection to be used in critical situations or emergencies, um, while also considering both the social and technical limitations and possibilities of creating such a community. Um, the questions that they were asking here was, um, you know, can we build a network that uses grassroots organizing, um, trust and, and accountability structures to create a digital framework and community that addresses emergencies, critical uh, situations and distributes care and resources within our communities without surveillance, sp specifically for the queer communities. And, and would this network enable us to do this? Um, you know, if it did, how could we encourage others to, to use it? Um, because of course that's always a really big question is you, you can have the ideal dream, um, you can build the, the technology and the networks, but I mean, truthfully, it is difficult sometimes to get people to adopt these things, and it's one of the big challenges. One other piece we had in our exhibition was um, called Biblioteca by Lucia Dosen and Michaela Lakova. And um, from their site, they say the Biblioteca is a framework to, to facilitate the local distribution of digital publications within a small community. Basically, um, it's a Raspberry Pi, which is again, broadcasting a, um, a wireless access point and hosting a um, web server on which people um, could access books and publications and also upload their own books and publications. So it's like a public library. Yeah, they go on to say that Biblioteca proposes an alternative model of distribution of digital text that allows specific co communities to form and share their own collections. The last piece I'll show was a talk at Radical Networks, and they also published a print book from the um, exhibitions that came out of the unauthorized SF MoMA show. Um, this is by Inar de Dios Rodriguez in collaboration with artist Lassa Scherfig and Ana Maria Montenegro Jaramillo. Um, so yeah, the unauthorized SF MoMA show was basically a guerrilla series of solo art shows that were staged at the SF MoMA in San Francisco um, from April 6th to July 2nd, 2017. Um, like Biblioteca, these were local area networks, wireless networks basically, that were set up with, with devices. I, I don't know which, but 
could be like a Raspberry Pi. So therefore, you had to be physically present within the range of the, of the wireless radio on the device in order to participate. But also because it was a, you know, a wireless access point, you could have this device powered by a battery in your bag broadcasting this um, network, that, which basically constituted a virtual gallery. Um, they, they were basically challenging the fact that most of the artists shown in the SFMOMA were white and male. Like, there's just not that much representation for other kinds of, of um, artists there. So they were inviting the general public, anyone, to come and upload their art and be a part of this virtual gallery in the SFMOMA themselves, if not physically having their works there, at least virtually. To come and visit our um, archives, we have, uh, we have video recordings of all the talks from since 2015, and I think starting around 2016, definitely since 2017, we started also recording workshops. So it's a really valuable resource for um, information. Um, I think there's got to be at least 120 videos in there since 2015, so there's, there's a lot. So in conclusion, I just would like to address, which for me is always the elephant in the room, which is, you know, everything I've said is all good and fine, and we all understand the problems with surveillance capitalism and our data being sold and, and all this. But, you know, I, and, and maybe this, this doesn't apply to people here, since you're at this um, event, but it's, it's a real challenge to get people to understand and also care about these, these, these um, issues. And um, it's difficult to give up convenience, for sure. And like I said, I'm guilty of it too. It, it's also difficult to, to come up with a sustainable alternative that has mass appeal. And that overwhelms me too at times when I think about it. But I think the thing to keep in mind is that um, while we might not be able to completely change the internet and the web and all that now, um, we may be able to affect what's happening on our blocks. Um, and, and as we saw in the case of Red Hook, like that has a real tangible um, effect. It, it's, it's worthwhile per, uh, pursuing. So I say that despite you know, how overwhelming it can feel to actually change things, um, you know, Radical Networks plans to keep promoting this, this, this kind of work um, like we've seen this evening and like I, I showed you here. Um, you know, the, the weird, the creative, the critical, um, you know, people doing things maybe they're not supposed to be doing, um, but for social, I mean, but also why not? Um, you know, for social justice, for activism, for art, for public knowledge. Um, and for education and for empowerment for all of us to be able to take back a little bit of control for ourselves. And also, to, I mean, the big thing, the thing that's important to me too is for people to at least have the option to um, learn. I mean, not everybody want, actually is going to care about wanting to know how to self-host, and that's fine. But if you do want to know, you shouldn't have to like, you know, it shouldn't be that difficult to, to find that, that information. I, I like to, to echo some questions that Phyllis Gashirni of Radical Software asked um, in, in the 70s, which was, you know, how are the means of communication controlled? Um, why are corporations allowed to purchase publicly owned bands on the electromagnetic spectrum? And, and also, and can light be sold? I just wanted to, um, to let you all know that Radical Networks 2019 is happening October 18th uh, through 20th at a venue called Prime Produce in Manhattan, New York. Um, We'll be opening up our call for proposals on May 1st. So if you have any ideas, um, please submit them. Um, we, we encourage uh, as everyone to, to uh, submit, even if it's your first time. Um, it doesn't matter to us. Like we, 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 we really want to know what people are out there doing with networks and radio technology. Um, and you know, if you can't join us in person in New York, we always have a live stream set up. So you should be able to, uh, to watch the talks and the workshops from wherever you are. Um, and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you.